What's up everyone, Pete Coco here. I am a headshot portrait photographer with A Studio in New York and today's video is all about taking better portraits. So I'm gonna give you seven tips to improve your portrait photography, specifically for those of you who use a Canon EOS R5, R6, R7, or R10 camera. Although some of the tips I'm giving you are more basic portrait tips. So even if you have a different camera system, Stay tuned, you're gonna learn something and I think you'll be glad you did. Before we continue, don't forget to gently press that like button. You do not have to smash it. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And if you wanna keep up with my latest videos, go ahead and hit the notification bell. At this point in time, I release them randomly and there's no rhyme or reason for it, for which I apologize. But if you don't wanna miss my next video, definitely hit the bell and then you'll know right away. All right, so let's get right into our tips, shall we? Tip number one, use the camera in servo AF mode with face tracking. Now I did a video way, way back on the autofocus modes in the camera where I kind of go through all of them. So if you are brand new to that part of the camera and you're confused just about the autofocus systems, you might want to check that out first. I will link it in the description below. But, uh, and I talked about a little bit about this subject I'm going to talk about right now, but one of the things that was a huge game changer for me when I got my R5 was the fact that I no longer felt like I had to shoot everything in one shot. So let me explain the difference. First of all, we're talking about the focusing method. So if you press your menu button and you go to the AF tab, which is the second tab in the menu, the purple tab. The very first option you have is autofocus operation and you have two uh, that you can choose from one shot or servo. So back in the old days of using my DSLRs and even back in the film days, I rarely, if ever shot in the continuous mode because it, servo is basically continuous focus one shot. What that means in a nutshell is that the camera will not fire the shutter until the focus has been achieved servo AF on the other hand, means that the camera would fire whether or not it was in focus. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why would I want it to do that? Well, say you're taking sports photos, for instance, and you have the camera on like rapid fire. So you're gonna take like 10 frames a second or five frames a second. The idea behind the servo AF was that the camera's gonna keep focusing as you keep firing and do its best to get as much in focus as possible. But the reality of it was back then, especially many times it didn't get f pictures in focus. A lot of them would be blurry. So I just avoided using that pretty much all the time, even when I shot sports. When I got my R5 though, because the autofocus system is so awesome, that was a complete game changer for me. So now I recommend actually shooting pretty much everything portrait wise in servo AF. Put the camera on servo AF and then go into the second menu, which is AF method. And go ahead and make sure that's on tracking, which is the first selection. And then the third selection, you want to track people, obviously, if you're shooting portraits of people. If, however, you're shooting portraits of animals, you have an option for that too. So what this does is the camera will continue to focus until you press the shutter button. But because the focusing is so good, even if you take a bunch of frames in a row, 99.9% .9 of them will be in focus. So this has been a complete game changer for me. I would have never in the past shot in continuous focus because I want the camera to lock and then fire. But this way you can take a lot more photos faster and really make sure you get that perfect expression in there. So I highly recommend trying this. That's my first tip for you today. Try this focusing method. Let me know how it goes. And uh, let me know in the comments if you like it or if you have a better way. Um, yeah, go ahead and put it in there. Tip number two, shoot in AV or manual mode and try auto ISO while you're at it. For those of you who are kind of new to manual shooting. Here's what I recommend. Don't shoot in program because you have no control over the camera. Press the mode button on the top of the camera and that will select all your shooting modes. What I would recommend for portraits is that you use AV. So either scroll this wheel to AV or you can simply just press it on the screen. And now you're in aperture priority mode. So what this means is that the camera will allow you to pick the aperture you want but it will pick the shutter speed. Now, if you have no idea what aperture is, um, I'll give you just very quickly a rundown. Aperture basically is the amount of light 
coming through the lens and it's represented by a number. The thing that's tricky about aperture is that the lower number means a wider aperture. So as I stop down my lens, like for instance, I have a 51.8 on the camera right now. 1.8 is the lowest number that this lens can achieve, meaning the widest aperture. As I go to f2.0, 2.2, 2.5, 2.8, continue all the way up to F22, the higher number really means that you're stopping down the diaphragm of the lens and letting less light in. The reason why you want a wide aperture, in other words, a lower number, is because it also affects how much of the frame will be in focus. And the lower number means a shallow depth of field. So if I use F1.8 and I focus on a person, pretty much everything behind them is gonna be thrown blurrily out of focus. That's what we call bokeh. And the reason you wanna do that is because a portrait is all about the subject. So you wanna use a wide aperture as wide as possible. This way you can throw your background out of focus and the, the, the photo is much more pleasing and much more uh, engaging when there's no distractions. So for instance, if I'm taking a picture of my kid in my backyard, I don't need that fence behind him or her in focus. It doesn't add to the frame. You can tell they're in a yard even when it's blurred out and it's gonna be a much stronger portrait if you blow out the focus of the background. So put it on AV and use the lowest aperture you can for your portraits, try that out. The thing that becomes a little tricky is that now the camera's controlling your shutter speed. This is great because the camera will pick the right shutter speed. And for a portrait, you're not usually as worried about the shutter speed as you are about the aperture. This gets a little dicey though, because if the camera can't get enough light, it's gonna use a slow shutter speed that might be too slow and result in blurry photos. So what I recommend, use auto ISO. So what you do is just press on the screen, the ISO button and scroll down to auto, hit set and you're all good. So now the camera will actually pick the shutter speed and the ISO to make sure that the aperture you've chosen makes sense. This is an awesome mode because now you don't have to think about all of these other settings. And if you're outside on a bright day, chances are it's going to be a low enough ISO and a high enough shutter speed that your subject's gonna look great. You can, however, go into the menu one more time if you're a little worried about the shutter speed it's gonna pick or if it's gonna pick a very high ISO that has a lot of grain. And you can go into the shooting menu and you go into the second shooting menu. The second option is ISO speed settings. And in there, you can scroll down to auto range and set that. So for instance, I don't want the camera to automatically use say, 51,200 ISO, because it's gonna be super grainy. I don't think it'll be useful, but I am okay with it going up to say 3,200. So now you've limited the auto range of the ISO, and this way, you're still going to not have to worry about the ISO, but you know, even if it goes up to 3,200, on this camera, on an R, you know, an R5, R6, and I would assume the newer ones too, it's gonna be more than acceptable. Uh, okay, now you can also go down if you're worried about the shutter speed that camera's gonna pick and you can leave it on auto, which I usually do. It's not a problem if you're outside on a nice day. Or you can leave it on auto and then you can use the um, scroll, use the command dial to scroll towards faster. And then it'll be like auto one, auto two, auto three, or slower. So you can tell the camera, no, I want you to use a faster shutter speed than whatever the focal length of the lens is. So you can tweak those options. I wouldn't even bother with that at this point. I would just keep it on auto and try that out. So again, I use this all the time. If you're a beginner or an intermediate, or even if you're advanced, try it out. Aperture priority, auto ISO, and see what happens. You're gonna get awesome results. Tip number three, opt for a fast prime or zoom lens over a slower zoom lens. Now, one of the things I see people do all the time, which makes no sense and kind of negates the greatness of the camera you get, is they buy the camera with like the cheapest kit zoom lens you can get. The problem with this is now you have an awesome camera body, but a lens that's not gonna let you utilize it. So I highly recommend that instead of getting that zoom lens that's very slow, um, opt for a fast prime. And so I've laid out the lenses that I like to use and I'm gonna talk about them real quick. Now, this is the first 
RF lens I've purchased so far. This is the 50 millimeter 1.8, little nifty 50. And I did a review on this as well. If you'd like to check that out, it's linked below. Overall, I do like the lens and for the price, it's under 200 bucks. It's a great value and it's a great starter portrait lens if you don't have anything else. So check that out too. But the reason why you want a prime lens over a zoom lens or a fast zoom lens is because that's going to allow you to get um, that blurred out background that you want for beautiful portraits. The problem with kit zoom lenses is that they're usually relatively slow. So if your kit lens has a variable aperture from like 3.5 to 5.6, you're never gonna get great results with that, uh, with Knight's Bokeh, and they're not gonna be as good. So don't buy a, a, an R5. And you know, I know people who have R5s who are not professionals, it's a great camera. Even if, even if you just love photography, maybe your career is in something else, but you want the best, you want to take awesome pictures that you're going to love forever. Yeah. Get an R5. I don't think, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If it's in your budget, do it, but don't cheap out on the lenses. Cause now you're not going to get the greatness of the camera. So here's what I like to use. First of all, one of my favorite lenses to use, as I said, is a 50 millimeter. 50 millimeter is a great portrait lens, believe it or not. Even though 50 millimeter, we consider this sort of like standard focal length. It's not wide, it's not telephoto, it's just a standard length. But a fast 50 is super sharp, very versatile. And actually I prefer my older 50 millimeter 1.4 because it's tack sharp and the 1.4 versus the 1.8, you can get a little bit more bokeh, you can get a little bit more of your subject out of focus. Cause the one thing I like to do a lot is maybe focus on the eye, but then blur out even where the ears start. So I highly recommend something like that. And again, these are all older EF lenses. So I'm using them with this adapter. Um, here's another great lens. This is an 85 1.8. Now 85 is really more like a standard portrait length. So it's better uh, for compression reasons than say a 50, because if you get too close with a 50 millimeter, if you want to get a tight, tightly cropped frame, then it will, even a 50 will introduce a little bit of distortion. 85 is more getting into the portrait range that we consider portrait length. So you'll get less distortion, won't have to get physically as close to your subject. So this is a great lens too, not expensive, small too, which is nice. Um, I also use sometimes my 100 millimeter macro. This is cool because it's another great lens. It's 2.8 fixed 2.8, not quite as fast as the others, but you can get super close. So if you want to really just get like a portion of the face and you don't even want to have a whole face in the frame or just the eyes or something like that, you can do cool things with it. So I use this sometimes not as much. And this is actually the lens I use the most for all of my headshots and a lot of my portrait work, I'm using this 70 to 200 2.8. Now this fixed 2.8 means that no matter where you are in the zoom range, it's 2.8. This is much better than variable aperture. It's much more expensive. So obviously you want to find something in your budget, but I will tell you that this is like the old, old version of this lens. It doesn't even have, um, image stabilization. This is like, super old by today's standards now. And I just have it with the adapter, the EF to RF adapter. And I use this on my R5 and I got to tell you, it does the job. It does awesome results inside, outside. This is one of the sharpest lenses Canon has made. It's beautiful. And, and the color rendition is amazing. So I love this lens dearly. And until I want to spend three grand or whatever on the RF version, this is the one I'm using. Opt for a fast prime over any kind of slow zoom. Tip number four, get close and don't be afraid to position the subject off center. Now, one of the things I see beginners do a lot and even some portrait photographers or photographers who are newer to portrait photography is they're afraid to get close to the subject. And so what I mean by that is you'll see like very wide framed subjects. Now, one of the things you see a lot with, with novices is they just stand there far off from whatever the action is. So say you're at your kid's birthday party and you're taking pictures. Well, they'll get photos like from way far away and snap the shutter, just standing there randomly in a corner. And now you have a picture that has three or four kids over here, one kid over there, balloons here, maybe a cake, garbage on the floor over there. There's so much in the frame that 
you're not you're not giving the person anything to lock onto. It's not a portrait at all. And even with portraits, I noticed that people are afraid to get close um, and to crop in close for some reason. Now, if you want an in-depth discussion about cropping for headshots and portraits, go ahead and check out my video on that subject, which is also linked in the description below. I go really in depth in it, but I will say for portraits and for what we're talking about today, a lot of the same kind of rules apply. If I'm outside taking photos uh, on a nice day, natural light portraits, I am not afraid to get close to the subject. In fact, I want as little distraction as possible. Think about it this way. Even in an environmental portrait, you don't need a ton of the environment to know where the person is. So if you're taking a photo of someone on a pier and there's a bridge behind them, well, a blurred out little piece of the bridge t tells them where, th where you are, what it is. It gives it context. Uh, or again, for a kid's birthday party, a photo that's much, much better and more engaging than that wide shot of the whole party scene is a picture of the birthday boy or girl with cake on their face, maybe holding a balloon, cropped close with a big smile. You still know you're seeing a birthday party, but now you're getting a real interaction with the subject. You're right there with them. So don't be afraid to crop close. Now for my portrait clients, when they come into my studio, I usually crop a little bit out because I, I don't want to crop their heads off in frame because then if they want the head in the frame, I've got a problem if it's not there. So I will crop a little bit in after the fact on my headshots and sometimes on my portraits too. So there's nothing wrong with leaving a little wiggle room, but there's no reason to have a huge wide frame if you want a portrait. Same thing with like taking pictures of musicians. You don't necessarily need the entire instrument in there. A little piece of the instrument is going to show people what it is. It's, an, it's a musician, okay? If you have a little piece of a guitar or uh, a piece of a bass or, or just like part of the instrument, it conveys the message without taking you away from the subject's expression. So remember that their expression is number one, most important. You want to see their expression. You want to be engaged and be a part of the frame. So don't be afraid to get close and crop close. Tip number five, shoot at your subject's eye level. Now this is related to cropping close, but a little different. Another thing that I see that's very common is that people will shoot down on their subjects. Now, if we're talking about headshots specifically, that was very, very common, or, and it still unfortunately is, a lot of photographers still take their camera and they do this, and, and then, then you get a picture of a person and they're like looking up at the camera. That's a horrible headshot because now when you shoot down on someone, you totally diminish them in the frame. Now, I understand a lot of reasons why people do it, um, sometimes if someone has a little bit of extra stuff under here and you just do that, it can kind of hide it a little bit, but there's better ways to fix that anyway. So that's not even a good excuse. The problem is now you've diminished your subject. Same thing with kids. You'll see a lot of photos where people just, they're taking pictures of their kids and they're standing up and they just go click. And now this could be really cool if done purposefully so that it looks like you're looking down into their scene. But most of the time, it's just not going to look right. It just looks like, okay, you're looking down on a scene. Much, much better than this is to get on their eye level and shoot them at eye level because now you're entering their world with your camera, especially if you're taking portraits. You don't want to shoot from far away and you don't want to shoot from above them. Uh, and you don't want to diminish them. The only time I'm going to try and purposely diminish a, a subject is if it's part of a story I'm telling with the photo, which usually is not, not much. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of people in your studio where you say, do you want me to make you look diminished in the photo? And they say, yeah, that sounds great. No, people want to be empowered by their photos. Uh, and you can even empower your kids by getting on their level. One of my favorite shots of my uh, son is this picture of him playing Monopoly and this picture of him playing chess uh, because I got on his level and took the photo instead of just shooting down on a scene. So from further away shooting down, it's like, oh, okay, kids playing a game. Nice, nothing special though. But now when you have on their level, it's like you're in the game with them. So definitely move around. In general, move. Don't stay in one spot. You see it all the time. You can tell a, a, a professional photographer from an amateur by one simple thing. A professional photographer moves. They're never always in one spot. They're always moving around. An amateur photographer is gonna stand in one spot and click, right? Don't do that. You gotta be moving. And this is even with 
studio headshots, sometimes just shifting the angle of your camera a little bit makes the biggest difference. Um, when I'm shooting my portraits, I'll move a lot because even without moving the lights, because sometimes the lights are fine where they are, but if you kind of come from this angle or from that angle or from slightly below, instead of just from where your camera is straight on, you're getting a whole different light fall off. You can get amazing images like that. So don't be afraid to move around and shoot at their eye level. Tip number six, shoot in continuous high mode. Now, one of the great options of the new mirrorless cameras is most of them are super fast. I'm talking about the drive mode, meaning how many photos does the camera take as you keep your finger on the button. So by default, you press the shutter button and the camera takes a photo. That's fine for everyday shooting. But if you're out doing portraits and you want to capture a bunch of images quickly because you're looking for that perfect expression, my recommendation is to shoot in high speed or even low speed drive mode. Now on the R5, if you're shooting with an R5, all you have to do is press the Q button quick and then you'll see there's the drive mode option which looks like a stack of papers on top of each other. You click on that and you can shoot single and then you have high speed continuous plus, which is the fastest, but it will only work with the electronic shutter. Then you have high speed continuous, which is not quite as fast. It's still super fast for mechanical shutter. Then you have low speed continuous. So I would choose one of these. Obviously, if you're doing action, or if you're doing people who are moving around quite a bit, you want as fast as you can get. And I mean, especially because what are you doing? You're not like wasting any money on film like in the old days. So if you put your camera on high in the old days, you could roll, you know, go through a roll of film in like 30 seconds. Uh, but there's really no downside except sorting through photos. So that could be a little annoying. But many times for my portraits, I will set the camera to the high speed. I used to set it to low speed. Now I'm experimenting with setting it to high speed. And most of the photos are not gonna be keepers in the sense that a lot of them will be very similar because it's firing so fast, but I'm able to really get that perfect shot that I want in the midst of all of that. So put the camera on high, don't be afraid. It's not gonna hurt it. The last thing you want is to be shooting in a single shot and then miss the shot because the camera wasn't ready for you and you weren't in focus like you should have been. Tip number seven, use the EVF instead of the screen. Now, this might be partially a generational thing, but at the same time, I still believe that the best way to use a camera is using it at eye level. So one thing that I see all the time with younger photographers is they shoot like this, right? The camera is out in front of you, you're doing this, doing that. And that makes it easier, I guess, in certain ways, but I feel like it's not the best way to use a camera. And here's why. First reason why is that now, if the camera's out here, you have all this distraction around you in your peripheral vision. So even though you're looking at the screen, obviously, you're, you're gonna be easily distracted by what's around you. I think it makes it harder to see what your actual subject is, how you have it framed, and all of that. A second reason is that it makes it easier when the camera's out here to have a little bit of handshake and get a blurry photo. Now I understand that most of these cameras have IBIS and everything else and so chances are even if you're a little shaky it's still going to come out good but remember that the best way to be steady with a camera is at eye level. When I do this my face is keeping the camera steady. Uh, so it's much easier to keep it steady that way. But the main reason why I suggest shooting at eye level is because it makes it so much easier to compose your image and see everything that's going on. Having the camera at eye level is really the best way to know what's in your frame, what's not, how it's framed, is your focus achieved critically, what's your exposure like. So I definitely recommend shoot that way. Try it out. Let me know if you like it. If you've been shooting here all the time and you never thought of doing it up at eye level, give it a try. This is how we all did it in the old days because we didn't have screens on our cameras. Now, don't get me wrong. I love having the option because there's times where you want to angle the camera and get a, a portrait from a certain angle where you can't use the viewfinder or if it's above heads. So, Having the rotating screen and shooting from the screen is awesome. I do it sometimes, but 90% of the time when I'm shooting portraits, I want to get the camera at eye level. It's easier to see settings. It's easier to see focus and all of that. Now I'm going to prove to you that it's better very quickly. And here's why.
because you do this too. Even if you shoot with the camera out here, here's what you do. You take a picture and then you press the menu button and then you look it on the screen and then you do this. You put it up to your eye to review your images in playback because you can see them better, right? I think everybody does that. So that to me proves that shooting with the camera up at eye level is the best way to really see what's going on. All right, well, that's it. There's your seven tips. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it. As usual, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Gently press that like button. You don't need to smash it. Hit the notification bell if you want to know when my next video is going to pop up. And once again, let me know what you think uh, in the comments. Try out some of these tips. Tell me if they work for you or if you found a better way. I'd love to know it too. I'm always looking to improve. And that's it for today. So go out and take some amazing pictures. Have a great day with your camera. Until next time, bye for now. Mm -hmm.